makes sense. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Right. So this is the last question, and we feel it's 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 probably the most fun. So uh, yeah. take so it away. So some scholars and laymen who have read your books have come away with the impression that your portrayal of Maimonides depicts him as the anti-mystic philosopher. Said differently, your focus on Maimonides, Maimonides' polemics against mysticism implies he did not believe in mysticism in any capacity. Is this character's characterization true? Do you believe that the Rambam completely rejected mysticism in every sense, or that there's a dichotomy of Rambam the philosopher and Rambam the mystic? And unlike uh, Chacham Jose Faur's homomysticus, which presents him as, you know, um, basically he... It shows his connection to Maaseh Merkabah tradition. So Rambam is a mystic in a sense. So if you can clarify that. I can try. Um, all to, first of all, I regret the title of the book. I should have called it Maimonides' Disenchanted Universe. But I suggested that to my publisher and she said, you want to sell any copies? <laughs> <laughs> it's clickbait. It's clickbait, basically. <laughs> so she, but in any event... Uh, it all depends how you define mysticism. That's the question that you guys are raising. Yes. If you follow David Melech in Tehillim, assuming he wrote it, uh, the Pasuk says, Ta'amu ure'u kitov Hashem. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I take that to be a very good expression of a kind of mysticism which says you can have an unmediated, direct uh, experience of God. Like you taste something. Taste is of the uh, of the five senses, the one that's hardest to confuse. You can be misled with what you hear, what you see, from what you feel, uh, but it's very hard to mislead your tongue. Mm -hmm. you know, if it's salty, it's salty. If it's bitter, it's bitter. Uh, unless you're sick or something. But if you're, if you're healthy, it, it's an immediate sensation. So that's like a mild vision of, of mysticism. Uh, looking for an experience of, in effect, tasting God. I don't think Rambam thought in those terms. If you think that mysticism is seeking some kind of what the scholars call yurio mystica, i.e. becoming unified with God, clearly Rambam rejects that. Even though if we have a, we have a mutual friend in the North Shore uh, the island is trying to prove it. that's the Rambam's case, but no. What, what, what? Yeah, he was talking about the rabbi who wrote the book. Right? Oh, okay, 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 sorry. Yeah. Good guy, but wrong on this case. Uh, but if you say, does Rambam believe that everything that's true can be expressed in discursive language? I would say no. Uh, that philosophy can lead you very, very far, but there are places where you simply have to hope for a kind of illumination. Um, I'm about to give you a silly example. I have been happily married now for 52 years or 53 years. I'm not good at the math. And one of the few things that my wife does which annoys me is she will say something and be right, even though her reasons for it are wrong. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> makes me crazy. But she really has an intuitive take that is almost always correct. Now, I think that you have to be foolish to deny that kind of thing. I think that we can reach a stage of intuitive understanding which cannot be expressed clearly in language. Ramam says this. I'm not giving him words that, uh, that I'm making up. Uh, the whole point of teaching Masse Merkava to one student and only one student, Shemevin Me'atzmo, who understands by himself, is, in effect, to show him the way, and either he makes the leap or he doesn't make the leap. Right. And what he, what he leaps to is a deeper understanding. It's not, a, but even his understanding or her understanding is not one they can express discursively in language. So in that sense, I think Rama was a mystic. And that makes, you know, that satisfies your desire for Maimonidean my, my mysticism. Yeah. I'm happy with it. So you agree with Faur on, on this? Yeah, yeah. I, I, Jose Faur was a very smart man. Uh, and, and he is one of the few people who read the Maimonidean in Arabic only. Yeah. 
and against the background of the world that Rambam, that Rambam lived in. I always like to tell my students, one of the reasons I like Rambam is that he's like me. He wrote in, he wrote in Hebrew, but he was thinking in Arabic. Huh. I spend my life here writing and teaching in Hebrew, but speaking in English. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of places where, not just me, people who know, can show you where Rambam's Hebrew reflects the Arabic he was thinking in. Mm -hmm. The very first sentence of the Mishnah Torah, the very last sentence of the Mishnah Torah, have the same Arabic expression, Yesham. And there are many others. So that um, Fawar didn't have that problem. He read the Mordebuchi in the original Arabic before he got to, I don't know if he ever read it in any, kind, any translation. He probably did, but he didn't have to. So he was a very smart, very smart and very learned man. He had his own uh, Mr. Gossam, if I'm allowed to speak in that language, about a guy like Fawar, who was a Sephardi to Hor. But um, <laughs> aside from that, this on this case, I think he's 100% right. But Rambam tells us, I, we, we were talking about this before the, uh, the session started, it's something I heard from Jonathan Sachs, all of a sudden. In chapter 51 of part three of the guide, Rambam, in effect, is trying to lead us to the series of what we'd call today spiritual practices. And Rabbi Sachs told me once that the whole point of the, of the Moran Hukim, the God of the Perplex, is to teach you how to say Kriyat Shema, how to say the Shema Yisrael. Because that chapter of the guide is all about the proper way to say Shema Yisrael. Uh, but it involves an awful lot of physics and metaphysics, etc. But it really struck me that Rabbi Sachs was right. Uh, Ramam wants us, to the extent possible, to learn how to say Shema properly. That was his life goal. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that, if you want to call that mysticism, fine with me. I mean, but we, the, the issue here is really how you define the term, not what Rambam felt. Now, there are plenty of scholars. Uh, David Blumenthal of Emory University, for example, strongly emphasizes the mystical aspects of Rambam's uh, views. Uh, and he does it through the through the analysis of language in those chapters, the last three chapters of the Guide of the Perplex, arguing that there's a lot of uh, Sufi language there. Uh, and it cannot be denied that Rambam's descendants and followers were not Maimonides, <laughs> in the sense that they were strongly impacted by uh, contemporary Islamic mysticism. Mm -hmm. Including his own son, Rabbi Avram, right. yep. who was certainly a rationalist, but was really impressed by a lot of what he saw around him in the, among Muslim mystics. Uh, so, what, also, what, so what, I, what I wanted to actually get back to with Homo Mysticus um, of, of Chacham Faur is the idea that uh, Ma'asem Rekaba, as we see in the Talmud and any references to it, like you said, it's a Rebbe to student, and the, and the student would have to, it would be a subjective his subjective understanding of a certain idea and how he would tell it over would determine whether or not he was receiving uh, the message properly. The and yeah. exactly. So, so why, why, how this? I want people to understand that this mystical uh, tradition that the Rambam is referring to is vastly different than the Kabbalistic tradition, which oh, is, is in a, it's an objective view of the world and it tries to define God, um, especially later on as. Kabbalah becomes more systematized, like in the Lurianic tradition. Yeah. Um, it becomes almost like uh, like Gnosticism 2.0. Yeah, so, that's a very good point. Yeah, I mean, uh, what we call Kabbalah today, and ever since the Ari and before the Ari, I really know very little about it. Uh, um, it's so dramatically opposed to Rambam, that it's hard to believe that the Rambam and Founders of Kabbalah, just a minute, Julian. Founders of Kabbalah were in this state, uh, because you know, the, the, all this discussion of the Sfirot as being, in effect, part of God or not part of God, um, <coughs> the idea that behind the God we can communicate with is the Ain Sof, uh, all this is to simply introduce non monotheistic elements into Judaism and to Rambam. Complex unity. They're creating yeah, a complex well, Take up your mind. Complex or unity. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. Rambam did want to play games. Mm -hmm. 
So for him, if you weren't willing to really talk about divine unity per se, you were in another yeah. another game. You weren't in the Jewish game. Um, and certainly, you mentioned theurgy before, certainly nothing we do influences God. That's idolatry. Yeah. Another form of, before we go, just one other point I want to make about the theurgical uh, side is of of this mystical tradition called uh, post zoharic Kabbalah is the idea it's developed since the since the Ari and Hasidut is panentheism the idea that you know God is imbued in all things and there's different that that means that there's different objects people places that have a certain degree of divinity in them. And that we, you know, we have to raise the sparks of kedusha out of those things, like reunite, reunite. Let's say the the shechina with the the kucha brichu shchinte, right? The we're 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 kind of we are in charge of bringing those things back together. God is kind making of a prisoner God of his whole world. again. Yes, making God whole again. And people today don't seem to have a problem with the idea that you know, okay, so the, so it's pantheism. So there's God. They don't see the connection between you know the world that the the Torah is trying to go against, which is you know, believing that again, just like idolatry and in, in the pagan world, there wasn't, they didn't believe that, that their God was the only God. They believed in many, many gods and some gods were more powerful than others. And there was degrees of divinity expressed throughout in nature. nature. Yeah. And we have, and, and by do, by serving those idols, we're kind of raising the sparks. It's, it's almost the same thing. Uh, don't have to convince me. <laughs> yeah. So. Absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. I think Ramam sought to purify Judaism. And failed. Right. Yes. People like you are doing the job. We hope to be even. Uh, we can only small... do what we can do, our own small yeah. part. That's it. Yeah. And you as well. So what, we want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast. We really appreciate it. We it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. Thank you. And we, we, we hope to do that. this again. We have a lot more to talk about with you. So. With great pleasure. All right. Okay. Thank you. Professor Shavuotov. Thank you, Toda. Bye. Leave. Leave.